Hello and welcome to the first episode of the Asia Pacific International Humanitarian Law Podcast. In tandem with increasing interest in international humanitarian law and humanitarian affairs in the region, this podcast hopes to capture evolving regional thoughts and voices on international humanitarian law in Asia and the Pacific. This inaugural edition discusses nuclear weapons and the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, or TPNW, that was adopted in 2017. Last month, the world solemnly commemorated 75 years since the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki on the 6th and 9th of August, 1945. Amidst recent developments and postures by states with regard to nuclear weapons, the Asia-Pacific IHL podcast tackles this new international humanitarian law treaty. In the run-up to its adoption, many Asia-Pacific states joined the clarion call about the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. States were encouraged in 2017 to vote for the adoption of the treaty. This treaty was not the first weapons treaty to be formulated based on the humanitarian impact of the weapon concerned. In fact, before 2017, the Anti-Personnel Mine Ban Convention of 1997 and the Cluster Munitions Convention of 2008 also trod a similar path. The Arms Trade Treaty of 2013 also has a humanitarian motivation. In 2017, 122 states voted for the adoption of the treaty, with one abstention and one vote against. Since then, an increasing number of states are now party to the treaty, and other states continue to work toward becoming party. Today, 45 states are party to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. 50 ratifications are needed for the treaty to enter into force. Nuclear disarmament has inspired states and regional groupings in Asia-Pacific to adopt regional treaties related to nuclear weapons, such as firstly the Treaty of Rarotonga or the South Pacific Nuclear Free Zone Treaty of 1985, and secondly the Bangkok Treaty or the Southeast Asian Nuclear Weapon Free Zone Treaty of 1995, and thirdly in 1992 Mongolia declared its entire territory a nuclear weapon-free zone. This was recognized by the United Nations General Assembly in 2000. In addition, the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, or the NPT of 1968, is well adhered to in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. The Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, or the CTBT of 1996, has yet to enter into force, although it is well adhered to in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. With us today, We have three speakers who will speak in turn about the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Firstly, we have Her Highness Tansri Tunku Putri Intan Safinas, Binti Al Marhun Sultan Abdul Halim Wadzam Shah, Tunku Tamangong Kedah, and National Chairperson of the Malaysian Red Crescent Society. Secondly, we have Her Excellency Ambassador Del Higi, Permanent Representative to the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva, and New Zealand's Ambassador for Disarmament based in Wellington. And thirdly, we have Mr. Takashi Koizumi, Secretary General of Mayors for Peace and Chairperson of the Hiroshima Peace Culture Foundation based in Hiroshima, Japan. And I am your host, Fiona Barnaby, Regional Legal Advisor of the International Committee of the Red Cross based in Bangkok, and your host, for this edition of the podcast. Welcome, everyone. There have been significant developments in disarmament in recent decades, specific to nuclear weapons. Intergovernmental conferences on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons were organized in Norway in 2013 and in Mexico and Austria in 2014. These created significant momentum and generated strong interest in a ban on nuclear weapons. In 2015, an open-ended working group, or OEWG, was established established by the United Nations General Assembly, and it was given the mandate to substantively address concrete, effective legal measures, legal provisions, and norms that will need to be concluded to attain and maintain a world without nuclear weapons. Chaired by His Excellency Ambassador Thani Tongpat Di, Thailand, the open-ended working group recommended 
that the UN General Assembly convenes a meeting to negotiate a legally binding instrument to prohibit nuclear weapons. In December 2016, the UN General Assembly adopted Resolution 71258, which decided to convene negotiations for the treaty in 2017. Your Excellency, Ambassador Del Higgy, following the decision of the New Zealand government on the 14th of May 2018 to approve ratification of the TPNW, New Zealand's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Winston Peters, said, and I quote, joining the treaty is a logical step for New Zealand given our long-standing policy opposing nuclear weapons. Ambassador, your state has been a stalwart supporter of the treaty. Could you walk us through some of the reasons for the enrollment and support of New Zealand for the treaty? Our awareness of the horrific and indiscriminate destructive power of nuclear weapons underlies our approach. New Zealand and other countries of the Pacific have seen firsthand the humanitarian consequences of the use and testing of nuclear weapons. Some of our near neighbours in the Pacific still today continue to live with the appalling environmental and health effect from that testing. The two other types of weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapons and biological weapons, had both already been banned, including on the basis that their use was not compatible with the terms of international humanitarian law. So New Zealand saw no reason why you wouldn't also ban the most destructive weapon of mass destruction of them all, nuclear weapons, in which equally can't be used in accordance with international humanitarian law. Thank you, Ambassador, for sharing the rationale for New Zealand's support for the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. However, there was fairly robust resistance from some states that possess nuclear weapons leading up to and during the negotiations of the treaty in 2017. What drove New Zealand to press on in the face of such vehement opposition from certain states who were probably close allies in other matters? It was increasingly clear to New Zealand that the 1968 Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and its grand bargain, disarmament and return for non-proliferation, was not going to deliver us the progress on nuclear disarmament that we had expected. Disarmament efforts had stalled, indeed seemed to be going backward. So my country and the many other supporters of the elimination of nuclear weapons were faced with a choice. Either continue living with the status quo, with nothing much being done about the many thousands of nuclear weapons still in existence and all the risks that that entails, or try to make some progress, even though what you might do isn't going to be supported by everybody. If we'd had the support of some of the possessors of nuclear weapons, that new path could have involved a process of reductions in the actual number of nuclear weapons. But since none of those countries were on board, we had to tackle the issue from a different perspective. We borrowed from the approach begun in 1925 for the banning of chemical weapons, an approach which put prohibition ahead of elimination. We drafted a treaty with a prohibition on nuclear weapons similar to the one our nuclear weapon free zone treaties had. But this prohibition is a global one. For New Zealand, just as we don't see these weapons as legitimate in our region under the South Pacific Nuclear Weapon Free Zone, we were saying that this should also be the case globally. We were sending a clear signal that we do not see these weapons as acceptable anywhere and by any standard, including that of international humanitarian law. Thank you, Ambassador. Given the tense political dynamics between nuclear weapons states and non-nuclear weapons states, I turn to Mr. Takashi Koizumi, Secretary General of Mayors for Peace. Mr. Koizumi, we have talked now about this treaty being one of the few treaties to have had the advantage of vigorous support from civil society. The International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, or ICANN, and their 2017 Nobel Peace Prize comes to mind. Could you tell us about Mayors for Peace and its role in the adoption of the TPNW? Mayors for Peace, in which I served as a Secretary General, is a non-partisan organization made up of the heads of local governments 
of over 7,900 member cities in 164 countries and regions, with our ultimate goal in mind that realizing lasting world peace, we have set two main objectives. One is the realization of a world without nuclear weapons, and the other is realization of safe and resilient cities. Means for Peace works to create an environment in which civil society in solidarity across borders can undertake various initiatives and for policymakers around the world to take decisive leadership to make such changes. So with the hope of, of realizing a world free of nuclear weapons while the Hibakusha are still alive in 2003, Mayors for Peace developed the 2020 vision. It is a set of concrete action guidelines aiming for the abolition of nuclear weapons by 2020. Objectives set in the vision include the immediate start of substantive negotiations toward Universal Nuclear Weapon Convention and the conclusion of that treaty. To achieve these objectives, we have developed various activities in collaboration with the member of cities and related uh, organizations. These efforts were promoted through fostering and the growing international public opinion toward uh, nuclear oppression and have supported the movement toward the adoption of the treaty. I would also like to mention that the role played by Mayors for Peace in the process of negotiations for the treaty was not for a small matter. In March 2017, Mr. Komizo, the former Secretary General of Mayors of Peace, attended the first session of the UN negotiations of the treaty. Mr. Komizo made a couple of proposals to achieve the effective legal prohibition of nuclear weapons. I think the most significant proposal among them was that an article or a clause needs to be drafted for the amplification of the treaty as its circumstances evolve, covering such issues as verification, environmental protection, compensation, and other relevant subjects to ensure wider participation in the treaty, including by nuclear armed states. In June of the same year, Mayor Kazumi Matsui of Hiroshima, who also served as the President of Mayors of Peace, attending the second session, Mayor Matsui appealed to make treaty to be a free, effective, legally binding instrument to prohibit nuclear weapons through open and constructive discussions. I believe these efforts helped the treaty to become a reality. Mr. Koizumi, the role of civil society and organizations such as yours has been described as indispensable in ensuring support for the TPNW. Could you talk about the work of Mayors for Peace in encouraging states, including Japan, to become party to the treaty? Mayors for Peace sets urging all states to participate in the treaty as soon as possible as a high priority item is current action plan to foster international public opinion so that the treaty will enter in force at the earliest date. We call on all our member cities in Japan and abroad to encourage their citizens through petition drives and other activities. In addition, we attended NPT review conferences held at the UN to convey the realities of the atomic bombings and Hibakusha's desire for peace. With these two essential messages, we extensively call for representatives attending the conferences to promote the importance of advancing the treaty. I would also like to point out that Mayor's Peace annually adopts a motion to send a letter of request to the Japanese government. In these letters, we strongly urge Japan to sign and ratify the treaty as soon as possible and to take the lead on advancing nuclear disarmament are the only country to have experienced the devastation caused by the atomic bombings. Furthermore, the Hiroshima Peace Culture Foundation, of which I am chairperson, administrates and operates the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum. In the fiscal year 2019, the number of visitors to the museum broke the record for its 65-year history reaching over 1.75 million people. About 30% of them were from overseas, showing that the museum has a great influence 
both abroad as well as in Japan. We believe that having visitors deepen their understanding of the treaty will lead to expanded international public support for the conclusion and entry in force as soon as possible. To do this, museum has a special display on the treaty. The display uses a world map to show the current status of the treaty in an easy to understand way. It illustrates which nations have signed and ratified the treaty and how many more ratifications are needed to reach the goal of 50 for it to enter in force. Thank you, Mr. Koizumi. A public poll conducted by Japan's national broadcaster NHK in December 2019 found that 66% of Japanese people believe that their government should join the TPNW. 17%, on the other hand, opposed joining the treaty, and the remaining 16% were undecided. In August of 2020 of this year, on the 75th anniversary of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, the mayor of that city, Mr. Kazumi Matsui, called on the government of Japan to heed the appeal of Hibakusha that it sign and ratify and become a party to the TPNW. Mr. Koizumi, how is the dialogue evolving with the government of Japan on the TPNW? And how are you dealing with the dilemma arising from the difference in the stance between the government of Japan and the public or civil society? Many Hibakusha have been seeking for so long for the treaty to be joined by all states, including Japan, for them to work towards the abolition of nuclear weapons. As the poll by the NHK indicates, the same can be said of many citizens of Hiroshima and of Japan. However, as I understand it, the Japanese government's position is to insist that nuclear armed and non-nuclear weapon states must proceed with abolition together step by step. They say that the treaty is premature considering the current situation in which the nuclear armed states are opposed. As the only country to have experienced nuclear attacks in warfare, Japan has a responsibility to do its utmost in taking leadership to advance nuclear disarmament. As I mentioned earlier, Mayors of Peace, of which 99.5% of municipalities in Japan are members, adopts a motion every year to submit a letter to request or to the Japanese government demanding it make such movements, signing and ratifying the treaty as soon as possible. As you pointed out in your question, it is Fat Mayor Matsui of Hiroshima, who also is president of Mayor of Peace, put a great emphasis on its, his peace declaration this year. We hope that the Japanese government will sign and ratify the treaty and play a role in international society as a bridge between the nuclear armed and non-nuclear weapon states to foster and promote dialogue and cooperation between them. We will continue to persistently make such appeals to the government through robust coalition of civil society. Thank you, Mr. Koizumi. A challenging situation indeed, and yet much hope in the work of civil society. Turning now to the Malaysian Red Crescent, Your Highness Tukuputri, Similar in some ways to the work of civil society is the work of the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement. National Red Cross and Red Crescent societies around the world, which are a part of this movement, have privileged access and influence with their governments. Your Highness Tunku Putri, as chairperson of the Malaysian Red Crescent Society, can you share on the work of the society with regard to the TPNW? Thank you, uh, Fiona. The Malaysian Red Crescent Society has actively supported international and domestic initiatives to highlight the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. We were present at two of the international conferences on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons in Nayarit, Mexico and in Vienna, Austria. This aligns with the Malaysian government which has long supported nuclear disarmament efforts. 
Thus, it is no surprise that Malaysia's National Red Crescent Society worked closely with its government to ensure that this treaty is ratified by Malaysia and other states. We are very proud to be part of Malaysia's efforts to achieve a world without nuclear weapons. In Southeast Asia, all ASEAN states are party to the Bangkok Treaty of 1995. This is not an accident, but a testament to the single-minded focus of ASEAN countries to ensure that its people never have to suffer the humanitarian consequences of the use of nuclear weapons, either intentionally or by mistake. As a Malaysian, I cannot fail to mention here that the distinguished Malaysian obstetrician, Dr. Ron McCoy, who first proposed the establishment of an international campaign against nuclear weapons, or ICANN, in 2005. As a physician, he reached out to fellow physicians. Thus, it was doctors who advocated for a new approach to nuclear disarmament. Indeed. Thank you, Your Highness Tunku Putri. But perhaps I could ask, why would a national Red Cross or Red Crescent Society, support nuclear disarmament and an international treaty banning nuclear weapons? The Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies are involved because we are the ones who would try to respond in the humanitarian and environmental impact of the use of a nuclear weapon. As we are usually the first responders on the ground and continue to care for survivors, like the Japanese Red Cross that continues to care for the nuclear bomb survivors or the Hibaksha, then it makes perfect sense that we would support a ban on nuclear weapons. If a nuclear incident occurs, it is our frontline volunteers who will put their lives on the line. Several Red Cross societies support nuclear disarmament as they have first-hand experience of the devastating effects of nuclear testing. In the Pacific, Red Cross societies of the Marshall Islands, Samoa, the Cook Islands, Kiribati and Vanuatu, all are vocal supporters of the need for nuclear disarmament. As an international movement, we have a nuclear weapons movement support group that meets online to implement our movement action plan on the non-use prohibition and elimination of nuclear weapons. Critically, our work plan aims to engage young people. Thank you, Your Highness. Could I ask, why is the support of a National Red Cross or Red Crescent Society important to ensure better adherence to the TPNW? And does the Malaysian Red Crescent have plans to raise awareness on this important issue? In our regular exchanges with our governments, we encourage and influence the relevant authorities, such as the Ministry of Defence and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, on our country's stance on this issue. Malaysia clearly supports nuclear disarmament. Ambassador Tan Sri Razali Ismail spoke for Malaysia in 1995 at the International Court of Justice as it considered the legal status of the use of nuclear weapons. Our current ambassador in New York will chair the nuclear disarmament discussion at next year's NPT review conference and recently led negotiation of an important joint statement on nuclear disarmament. For now, the Malaysian Red Crescent Strategy 2030 includes steps to raise awareness about the issue, especially among the youth, and work with government agencies to facilitate and support ratification of the TPNW. We believe that by working with the Malaysian government, we create a conducive environment for Malaysia to ratify the TPNW. This collaboration can be an example for other national Red Cross and Red Crescent societies to work with their governments. In fact, I am pleased to announce that MRCS, or the Malaysian Red Crescent Society, has been invited to witness the signing ceremony of the instrument of ratification for the TPNW by the Malaysian Minister of Foreign Affairs, 
on the 30th of September. Once signed, it will be a day of quiet celebration for us and the movement as we feel we have contributed towards this process in Malaysia. Thank you, Tunku Putri. As a long-standing supporter of the ban on the use of nuclear weapons, Malaysia is not alone in the region. Does the Malaysian Red Crescent interact with other national Red Cross and Red Crescent societies in the region on this issue? Yes. For in December 2019, many of our societies gathered in Geneva for our 33rd International Conference of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement that occurs every four years. I was personally moved by the stories of my colleagues from other Red Cross and Red Crescent societies. Notably, the Malaysian Red Crescent supported the pledge of the Austrian government and the Austrian Red Cross on the humanitarian effects of nuclear weapons. All of us are working collaboratively to sensitize governments, public opinion, youth, and the future of our nation on the importance of reining in the use of this weapon. Thank you, Your Highness Tunku Putri. From what you describe, a national society is in the enviable position of being closer to and trusted by their national government. I turn now to questions about a state's position on the TPNW. We have talked about how the TPNW is a boon for the architecture of nuclear disarmament. However, there are clear fault lines along which many states and some of the nuclear armed states have taken opposing positions. Ambassador Del Higgy, is the NPT still important given that we now have a treaty that prohibits nuclear weapons entirely? New Zealand's view on this is clear. The Prohibition Treaty is fully consistent with the NPT. That said, each treaty does certain things the other doesn't do, and each has its particular strengths and benefits. For example, the Prohibition Treaty is a much firmer basis for nuclear elimination because of its global prohibition and its position that there are no right hands for wrong weapons. But it is able, usefully, to draw on the NPT's link with the International Atomic Energy Agency and its safeguards arrangements. The NPT has a much wider range of parties at present, including the key possessors of nuclear weapons, so the obligations it sets remain of considerable importance. Especially significant among these, of course, is the obligation in Article 6 of the NPT on those with nuclear weapons to move towards eliminating them. To argue that the Prohibition Treaty complicates nuclear disarmament or that it flies in the face of the NPT is to fail to see the obvious value add of a global prohibition and stigmatizing nuclear weapons. The Prohibition Treaty gives us a better chance of moving ahead on nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation in the future than simply sitting with the status quo. Ambassador, some quarters have argued that non-nuclear weapon states joining the TPNW might choose to opt out from the NPT and thus free themselves from the verification requirements of the NPT, a kind of forum shopping, if you will. Are these concerns well-founded? This really is a pretty desperate kind of fiction. Someone really ought to try and explain to us what the supposed attraction is in abandoning the NPT to opt for the more complete set of prohibitions, including on testing and use, which are contained in the Prohibition Treaty. The suggestion that the Prohibition Treaty is somehow a soft option in terms of verification overlooks the point that the safeguard requirements in it draw on the NPTs and are in fact a tad stronger than those required under the terms of the NPT. That fact seems to be conveniently overlooked by the Prohibition Treaty's opponents. Let's take a look at this forum shopping idea in the context of North Korea, which is the country most often put forward by the Prohibition Treaty's opponents as the wannabe forum shopper. North Korea, which left the NPT some years ago, certainly long before the Prohibition Treaty, 
is looking to extract maximum leverage from having nuclear weapons. It has made it very clear that it has zero interest in reducing that leverage by joining a treaty which prohibits them, whether the Prohibition Treaty or the NPT. Of course, the focus on countries possibly opting out of the NPT ignores the fundamental issue about those who have chosen never to join the NPT in the first place. Countries like India and Pakistan have never accepted the NPT's approach of allowing some states, but not them, to hold their nuclear weapons for a transitional period. They're just not looking to join a partial prohibition regime like the NPT, which they see as locking them in to a strategic disadvantage. I mention this latter point in order to highlight one of the strengths of the Prohibition Treaty, its universal basis and framework for a global nuclear weapon-free world. Let's hope that in time, all states, including all nuclear weapon possessors, will join in and build on the TPNW's provisions to meet the obligation identified in 1996 by the International Court of Justice and mentioned just now by Tunku Putri about the obligation to negotiate in good faith on multilateral nuclear disarmament. Ambassador, following on from your reference to the NPT, could you tell us about your hopes and perhaps your concerns leading up to the upcoming NPT review conference, possibly to be held in January 2021? It's not yet confirmed when exactly the review conference will take place next year. But whenever it is held, my hope is that all NPT states parties will agree on an outcome document which can chart the way forward for the treaty. I'm concerned that not all NPT members may realise that success at the review conference will only come if there is forward movement on all the key issues, and especially on nuclear disarmament. Without progress on nuclear disarmament, the conference won't arrive at an agreement. Ambassador, what hopes can we have about a substantive final document at the NPT review conference? We have to remain hopeful on this. We must not talk up the chance of failure and allow it to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. But in order not to fail and to reach agreement on a final document, we will need strong leadership, above all from the NPT five nuclear weapon possessors. It's hard to see this at present. And Ambassador, where does the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty or the CTBT fit into this already complex mix of the NPT and the TPNW? The Pacific region had fought long and hard against nuclear testing. So when the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty was adopted in the 1990s, there was real euphoria in my part of the world. Even though the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty has never entered into force, it remains an important part of the disarmament architecture and its monitoring system does important work for the international community. But it provides us with a lesson against ever again drawing up a treaty like it, which has such a high threshold for entry into force that it never in fact reaches that threshold and remains legally inoperative. I think we've learned that lesson, and it was certainly carried through into recent treaties, such as the Arms Trade Treaty and the Prohibition Treaty, which have straightforward provisions for their entry into force. And I note that we should be reaching the entry into force threshold, ratification by 50 states, for the Prohibition Treaty within coming weeks. I confess to being something of a pessimist as to whether the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty will ever enter into force. That was one of the factors influencing the negotiators of the Prohibition Treaty to ensure we included in its prohibitions a ban on testing. It would have been a real gap to have left that out. We are now coming to the close of our podcast today, and we have a few more questions as we close. Some critics say that the TPNW will be ineffective 
as nuclear weapon states have indicated they do not intend to join. Your Highness Tunkuputri, Ambassador Dell, and Mr. Koizumi, what are your thoughts on this? Perhaps we could start with Your Highness Tunkuputri. Thank you. We will continue to work with young people. They will one day become part of government, perhaps part of governments that today do not intend to join the TPNW. The Red Cross and Red Crescent movement has been around for more than 150 years. We are 192 Red Cross and Red Crescent societies around the world. We plant seemingly small seeds of humanity, nurture them, and then wait for better things. Ambassador Dow, what about your thoughts? The absence of nuclear weapon possessors amongst the supporters of the treaty certainly means that it cannot by itself reduce the global stockpile of nuclear weapons. But numbers aren't everything. The Prohibition Treaty has real normative value. It signals our view that use of these weapons is incompatible with international humanitarian law, and it will help to stigmatize them. Mr. Koizumi, what are your thoughts on this? Okay, so indeed, even if many of non-nuclear weapon states have ratified the treaty, If it fails to include most of the nuclear-dependent states, the treaty will not establish legally binding effect in general international law beyond the contracting parties. On the other hand, when it enters in force with ratification by 50 or more states, the use of nuclear weapons will be deemed illegal by international society. This may make it much more problematic and difficult for the nuclear-armed states to use them in actual practice. Either way, we need to nurture a collaborative international environment where nuclear-dependent states can sit at the same negotiation table with the state's parties and engage in dialogue to ensure that the treaty will become a fully effective legal instrument for nuclear abolition. To that end, Together with our member cities and our civil society partners, Mayors for Peace will call on national governments to share in the Hibakusha's earnest wishes for nuclear abolition and encourage the nuclear armed states and their allies to join the treaty. Thank you. I would like to ask how we can possibly continue to engage nuclear weapon states beyond the TPNW. Ambassador Delhigi, perhaps we could hear you on this. We engage with the NPT's possessors of nuclear weapons, as well as those others who possess their weapons outside the NPT. Sometimes we do this bilaterally, just as New Zealand, but more often as a member of one of the nuclear disarmament groupings to which we belong. We discuss these issues in a range of forums, such as the UN's First Committee, the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva, and, of course, at meetings related to the NPT and its review process. And we talk about them, too, at regional get-togethers in our part of the world, like at the ASEAN Regional Forum and the East Asia Summit. Countries like New Zealand have never expected nuclear disarmament to take place instantly or overnight. We've also always pushed for what we call transitional measures, measures that help get us on the way to nuclear abolition and help reduce the risks we all run meanwhile from nuclear weapons. One such measure is termed de-alerting, lowering the launch readiness of nuclear weapons. It has always seemed pretty obvious to New Zealand how providing for a longer period of time before a decision is taken to launch a nuclear weapon, can reduce the chances of launch by accident or mistake. But not all the possessors of nuclear weapons have been ready to agree to this and to de-alert their weapons. What can we say to the claim that national security interests outweigh the benefits of becoming party to the TPNW? Perhaps we could hear first from Your Highness Dunkuputri. Yes, we feel that the humanitarian and environmental impact of nuclear weapons must also be considered. This was the rationale for the treaty. 
For the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, humanitarian concerns and the sustainability of the planet should supersede the interests of individual states. This treaty cannot just be words on a page at the United Nations. It must resonate with people on the ground and in governments. Thus, the Malaysian Red Crescent will work to raise awareness among Malaysian youth in schools and in universities. Ambassador Dell, what about your thoughts on this? We should not be talking about an individual state's security, nor that of just a few states. We need to look at global security, global human security. As President Macron said in a rather different context, there is no planet B. We should not be endangering the future and health of our planet with weapons as horrendous as nuclear ones. Mr. Kozumi, what are your thoughts on this? Such a self-centered way of thinking originates from those prioritizing the pursuit of only their own national interests. However, the threat of nuclear weapons concerns all of humanity, and we must thus primarily address it from a global perspective. In other words, the shared values of civil society have not yet been fully embraced by policymakers, and they are stuck in an environment in which they cannot take such joint action. Therefore, in order to break the status quo of dependence on nuclear deterrence and to get back on track toward nuclear disarmament, it is essential to create a supportive environment to give world leaders courage to shift their policies. It is our job to implement initiatives to ensure that civil society will make it shared value that the world should never rely on nuclear deterrence. Thank you, Mr. Koizumi, for closing this podcast and this conversation with this powerful parting point. Your Highness Tunku Putri, Ambassador Dell, and Mr. Koizumi, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today and for sharing your thoughts in this first edition of the Asia-Pacific IHL podcast. We hope you found this conversation entertaining and informative. The podcast will return with a look at IHL and cyber operations during armed conflict in the coming months. Thank you for listening.